continue our study of the subject of baptism this morning. Uh, we've studied the basics about baptism, what it is, what it does, all of those things associated with it. And over the last week or so, we've kind of shifted our focus to what do we do after we're baptized? Because we were baptized, what is going to happen after that? And this morning, we want to talk about the idea of following in Jesus' footsteps. Walk in the footsteps of Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And the question we want to ask this morning is, well, how do we do that? How do we walk in the footsteps of Jesus? What are some things we need to understand and think about? And understanding that, we need to realize that it means totally adopting his lifestyle. It's not something we do on Sunday morning. It's not something we do in the spur of the moment. It's something we do with every aspect of our life, with every thought we have, is kind of the idea of what would Jesus do. That was popular a few years ago, and I think it ought to be popular still because that should be a question we ask ourselves all the time. In this situation, what would Jesus do? Daniel gives us a perfect example of that. Taken away from his home, living in stressful circumstances, but God was with him and he was faithful to God and God blessed him throughout all the times of his life as he did those things that he knew he must do in order to be faithful to God and resisted the temptation perhaps to do those things that he shouldn't uh, have done. <clears throat> in Daniel 6 and verse 10, the key to what Daniel was able to do is it says, as he did before. Daniel had a routine, Daniel had a practice, and he continued that practice every day of his life, even in captivity, even when his enemies were trying to destroy him for his faith and for his works and for the good he was doing, he kept doing the same thing. And so this morning, let's think about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. What does that mean? What was that look like? What would I need to be thinking in order for me to do that? Well, number one, when we talk about walking in his steps, it means we are imitating a hero. You know, some, for some reason, we don't talk about Jesus as being a hero. I'm not sure why we don't, because he's the greatest hero that's ever lived. He saved us from our worst problem that we've ever had, and that's the problem of sin. You know, parenting brings a lot of thrilling moments. And parenting brings a lot of sobering moments. <clears throat> and one particular moment that seems to do... Both of these things is when you see a, a small child we're trying to wear daddy's shoes. It's a thrilling moment. It's a sobering moment. Daddy's shoes are just too big. But that doesn't keep the child from trying to walk in them. He tries to walk in those shoes because, well, most daddies to most little boys or girls are, are their hero. And as a child grows older, graduates from daddy's shoes, he graduates perhaps to daddy's life and the way that he or she has been brought up. And that's why it's sobering. It's a huge responsibility to be a parent. And when we think about walking in Jesus' shoes and he is our hero, we have to understand how important that is. He came to this earth and died fully aware that the sins I commit would require that death. And he did that willingly. Paul wrote in Romans 5, beginning in verse 6, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's why we're called Christians. Because we're seeking to be like Christ. We're seeking to follow in his steps. And as we think about what that means this morning, we have to realize Jesus is the greatest hero that's ever lived. He came so that we might have salvation in heaven. And so as a result of that, we ought to do what Jesus would do in any given circumstance. And sometimes that's hard. I imagine for Daniel it was hard at times, living in a strange country, to do those things that he was supposed to do. He challenged a king and said, we won't do that. I won't do that in risk of his life. Do we have the courage to be that way in our own lives today? Well, one of the things we need to be as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus is a good influence. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, we read, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Being a good influence. Letting Jesus shine through you. Someone says that they'd rather see a sermon than hear one any time. And that's probably a good thing to think about. If I can live as Jesus lived, my example will go a lot farther than me just telling people how they ought to live, especially if I'm not living quite as I should. If I'm not being a good influence and then I try to tell others how to live, that's not going to be received very well. But if they see me doing that in my life, then they respect it more. Jesus calls it salt. Jesus calls it light. And when we walk in his steps, those are good examples, good illustrations of that. I've got to be a good influence in my life, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's at the grocery store. No matter what the circumstance is, I have to demonstrate I would have to be like Jesus in those circumstances. And sometimes that's hard. We live in a tough world. We live in a difficult world. And sometimes other people don't act the way that they should. But that doesn't mean that I can't act the way that I should. I need to be a good influence in every situation, in every circumstance that I find myself in, if I'm going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. I need to control my temper. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. <clears throat> First be reconciled to your brother and then come to offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown in prison. Surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Closely related to that idea of being an influence is the idea of controlling my anger. And the most interesting aspect about the control about what Jesus is speaking in a Sermon on the Mount is he lived that in his life. Jesus was rejected by his family, John 7 and verse 5. He was rejected by those around him that he grew up with, Luke chapter 4 beginning in verse 23. He was accused falsely on so many occasions. He was taken through a mockery of a trial and ultimately put to death and yet, in all of those circumstances, Jesus was able to control his temper. Remember, the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Now, did Jesus get angry? Yes, he did. He physically cleansed the temple, driving out the money changers in John chapter 2 and Mark chapter 11. And 
Some would say, well, he lost his temper then. He went out of control. But I think the response to that is, no, he was fully in control of what he was doing. But he was not going to allow God to be disrespected by these people. And so in his anger at that, he responded and acted appropriately. There's, we might say, a difference between righteous indignation and losing one's temper. Anger is a God-given emotion. And if it's kept in the right place, it's useful, not harmful. But if we're going to walk in the steps of Jesus, we've got to learn to control that temper and not let it get the best of us. Another thought, we've got to overcome temptation. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. You know, as a student in college, went to a Christian college, studying preaching, obviously, we had devotionals, devotionals on a regular basis. And one of the things that was often part of these devotionals was a song that it's, we sang that it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And that was one that we sang pretty much at every devotional I ever attended while I was at college. The point of the song was, I think, enthusiasm for God and how one person could make a difference uh, to those people who are around him or her. Were it not for a small spark, a large fire couldn't exist. And though a small spark can be easily extinguished, the ending fire that results from that spark is hard to put out. And I think that illustration teaches us a very good lesson about the idea of temptation. James wrote, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. When lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's James 1, verses 14 and 15. Temptation itself is not a sin. Jesus was at all points tempted as we are, but he didn't sin, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. But temptation can be the spark that starts the fire. And if we learn to extinguish the spark, then there's no fire. The spark is much easier to put out than the fire. And so following in Jesus' footsteps mean we avoid the fire by avoiding the spark, by controlling the temptation. And so we've got to overcome that temptation and not give in to it. Walking in Jesus' steps means being honest. You watch children playing together for a while and you'll learn some interesting things. For example, one child promises to do something but it doesn't fulfill that promise. And when the second child challenges the first to keep his or her promise, the first child sa says, well, I had my fingers crossed. That's supposed to mean that the promise isn't actually binding. And where do children learn that from? Well, they learn it from adults. But the adults and the children of our day aren't the first experts in this area of reasoning. Those in Jesus' day determined to build confidence in themselves by spouting off oaths on every occasion. And the oath was supposed to bear with it the weight of, I am telling the truth. The problem with that is they had developed sort of a code to determine which oaths were binding and which ones were not. In other words, I could cross my fingers on the oaths I didn't want to, to follow through on. And that lack of honesty in life was completely contrary to what God was expecting of those who were following him. If we can't be trusted in everything that we say, then how can we be trusted to preach the gospel? In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 33, Again you have heard it said, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. We have to be honest. In, our thing, in the things we say, because if we're going to ever influence people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, if they know we're not entirely honest, how can they ever believe us about this great sacrifice? If we're looking for loopholes, instead of being honest, then we are part of the devil, who is a father of lies, according to John chapter 8 and verse 44. And so 
Walking in the steps of Jesus means honesty in every part of our life. Another thing we need to think about, walking in Jesus' steps means let's not put on a religious show. And by that, we simply mean, again, hypocrisy. It looks like we're religious when we're not. In Matthew 23, Jesus makes some of the boldest statements about this idea as he rebukes the scribes and the Pharisees. But all their works they do for the purpose of being seen by men, in verse 5. And there are many things found in Matthew chapter 23 that concern the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, but it, it seemed rooted in the idea of they wanted to look good before men even though they knew they weren't good. They wanted to put on a show. And we can be guilty of that. We go to church on Sunday morning, as we say, and, and hope the whole world sees us going to church on Sunday morning, but then the rest of the week we may live our lives completely at odds with what it is that we profess by going to church on Sunday morning. Again, it's that idea of hypocrisy. No matter what our actions are, if we have the wrong motivation behind our actions, then those actions aren't what they ought to be. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1, Paul wrote, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm just a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, if God is not being served or worship out of a proper motivation, we're putting on a show, and that show does us no good. And seeking to impress others with our spirituality is not the path to Christianity. Christianity is sitting in the humility seat and allowing the master to be seen through us. Make him the focus. Make him what people look at, not me, myself. And the importance of serving God is not found in my self-glorification of building myself up. If that's our service, if that's our motivation, then service will ultimately become a burden. It'll become tiring if that's why we do it. But when our motivation is not putting on a show, but living every day as we should, as one writer said, God is the audience. Walking in, Jesus, in the steps of Jesus will cause us to avoid putting on a show. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That should be the ultimate goal of everything we do, that God gets the glory and not me. Another thought, walking in his steps means laying up spiritual treasures. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, one of our greatest weaknesses as humanity is the inability sometimes to see beyond the surface. Beauty, success, love, honor, and just about everything, all of those sometimes are based on outward appearance. The problem is that this is entirely backward because everything is not that glitters is not gold, as the song says. The outside is corruption. It changes, but the inside should remain constant. Uh, though the physical man decays, the spiritual man is renewed as we follow God. That's 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 26. And when we think about the idea of wealth, it's external. It's temporary. It goes away. We see treasure, treasure in the physical sense. And Jesus was trying to give us a glimpse of true treasure by talking about spiritual wealth. Everything physical can be destroyed. And even if it's not destroyed, one day I'm going to have to leave it behind. The real honor in life comes after our life is over. We're working for heaven. I've got a plaque in my office that says, Working for the Lord doesn't pay much, but the retirement plan is out of this world. And I think that's the attitude we've got to have. We have to understand that we're laying up treasures in heaven. We have a place prepared for us, and that's where we ultimately want to be. And so we've got to understand that we've got to be laying up spiritual treasures, and we can't do that unless we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Another thought, we've got to practice righteous judgment. You know, it's tragic in the world when people take Scripture and misuse it. They take the, the Scripture that talks about judging, don't judge, and they apply it to every situation, which conveniently works in their favor. If they're doing something wrong and somebody criticizes them for that, oh, who are you to judge me? And unfortunately, that's not what 
the New Testament teaches at all. Yes, the New Testament teaches that we don't judge based on things we don't know, and that if we do judge, we're going to be judged with that same judgment. But we are required to practice righteous judgment. You know, the golden rule is a good thing that we live by. But sometimes I need to be called on the carpet. Sometimes you need to be called on the carpet. Sometimes we have to make judgments about things in life. And we need to do that righteously and carefully and nobly in life. And we need to understand Jesus made judgments. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. But he did that because they were righteous judgments. They were right judgments. And again, based on our previous point, he was able to control his temper in doing that when he was probably very angry with them, with those who were supposed to be the, relig the religious leaders of the day. <clears throat> Walking in his steps means, as we said, I've got a home in heaven. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the bottom line to everything else. No matter what's going on in this world, we have to understand that that is our ultimate goal. He never promised it would be an easy journey. In fact, he promised it would be just the opposite. But you know, Jesus' footprints are visible through the pages of his word. We know where to walk. We know where to step. We're told to walk in the light as he is in the light. Why? Because the light illuminates the footprints of Jesus. We have to be willing to submit to him and follow him and live according to his will. And we do that because we were baptized. Because baptism is the start of that glorious walk where we try to be just like Jesus. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus can be a powerful journey. His steps are unique. It's not simply that Jesus showed us the way to eternity but he showed us how to live a, a good life, a nice life here in this world. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas was confused after Jesus said that in John 14. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, not giving him a road map per se, but he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And whoever comes to the Father comes to him by me. That's John chapter 14 and verse 6. He didn't simply tell them about the way to the Father. He showed them the way to the Father. He became the way to the Father. Jesus didn't tell us how to live the abundant life he talks about in John chapter 10 and verse 10. He demonstrated it by living that abundant life himself. And so as we think about this idea of baptism and starting our walk with Jesus, starting our life as a Christian, again, we've said it's just the first step. It's the beginning. It's what comes after that that's the struggle. It's what comes after that that at times is, is very hard. But because we're baptized, we live that life. We started talking about Daniel. Again, Daniel was taken away from his home as a young man, forced to live in an entirely different culture, learn an entirely different language, learn an entirely different system. But Daniel was faithful in everything that he did, faithful to God's law, not Nebuchadnezzar's, not the Babylonian law, although he was faithful to that as far as he could go in his, his life, but he was faithful to God and God blessed him. And if we're faithful to God, he'll bless us as well in this life, but most importantly in the life to come. And that's the life that we're looking forward to. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and how it teaches us so many important things. Father, help us live according to that will in everything we do. We've talked about a few things this morning, and we know that this is not an exhaustive list of the things that we need to do. Help us to always be of the mindset, what would Jesus do in this situation? And help us to live that way. Help us to live according to his will so that we can be the light and the salt that this world needs. We can be the influence for the world to come to Jesus Christ. We pray this study has been a blessing to all who are listening. We pray you'll keep us safe, that you'll keep us healthy. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for being with us this morning. Our worship service will start at 10 o'clock this morning, and we hope you'll stay tuned for that. And, of course, Wednesday evening at 6.30, we continue our study of the book of Leviticus. And we've titled that study, The Pursuit of Holiness, and we hope you will join us for that. 
And until then, until we can see each other again, may God bless you richly. Well, good morning again. Good to see everybody this morning, and I hope you all had a safe and healthy uh, holiday. And it's always good to be back together. And if you're visiting with us, we're welcome. I hope you feel welcome. We have some people from Indiana and Colorado Springs, so I hope you all have a safe visit and a safe return. And if you're uh, worship with us remotely, you're also Welcome and happy that you're with us. And this morning, before I start our worship service, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're always grateful that we can be together, even in difficult times. Thank you, Father, for allowing us uh, to be here this morning and blessing us in the last week. And hope that everybody had a safe and healthy holiday. And Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling, uh, returning, and we ask for their safety. And Father, keep us safe. And we know that uh, we're always in your hands and you wrap your arms around us uh, in times like this. Thank you, Father, for this congregation, for the membership here, for each one here this morning, those that are worshiping with us remotely. Uh, we can always uh, know that uh, your presence is with us. And thank you, Father, for being with us this morning. And as we worship you and study your word. We ask that you be with us and be with uh, John as he leads our singing, with Brother Kevin as he brings our lesson. And Father, all the things that uh, we say and do this morning will be only to glorify your name. Again, Father, thank you for your blessings and uh, to caring for this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Flo. I'm happy to see you all here. Wait, yes, all of them. I had to throw that in. <clears throat> Our first song we'll sing this morning is The Love of God. Sing for two verses. The Love of God.
together. Dear Heavenly Father, as we approach you again during our worship service, we want to thank you for all the blessings you've given us, all the good things you spread upon us, all the benefits we have. We have holidays this time of season that are to, kind of to remind us of that in our lives. We hope that you will help us to remember all throughout the year that you are the controller of the plan, we are the participants in the plan, and that everything we do and everything you do is designed to help us be successful in that plan. Please remember those of our members who are under special needs, special circumstances, all the people that are shunned at home, all the people that are fighting illnesses, all the people that have medical conditions that require attention, just help them to get through this and realize that you are behind them. We ask that you be with us throughout the rest of the service Help us to worship in earnest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing two verses of this song, then we'll take the Lord's Supper. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. He If you're visiting with us, we have the communion cups and wafers that are available in the baskets by the doors, and we have somebody that can bring you one if you need to raise your hand at this time. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians this morning, starting in chapter 1, verse 23. And Paul writes, 
But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, whenever Paul wrote those words, you know, there's two major cultural influences we're all aware of, where the Jews obviously were expecting a different sort of Messiah, some sort of national leader that would lead them back into prominence. And then obviously the Greeks kind of reflecting the idea of the pagan thought and the, uh, the idea of powerful gods that people would worship who would never submit themselves to die for humanity. But Paul distinguishes Christians and basically summarizes all of Christian thought into those two words, Christ crucified, and what those mean. Would you bow with me as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus? Heavenly Father, at this time we remember the sacrifice of your son on the cross who came to earth, who humbled himself, and who died on our behalf for our sins. And Father, as we remember that sacrifice, we pray that we do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bow with me again as we give thanks for the cup? And likewise, Father, we pray your blessing on this cup that we're about to partake that represents the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. And again, we pray that as we partake of this emblem that we do so remembering the sacrifice of your son. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And this concludes our observance of the Lord's Supper at this time. Um, we'll give thanks for the offering of the church. There's multiple options for doing so. You can do it through the website, through your own banks, or there are baskets left at the exits of the building that you can leave your contribution there. And again, would you bow with me one more time? Heavenly Father, we also give you thanks for the many material blessings that you have given us, the opportunity to live in the country that we do and to earn a living for ourselves, take care of our family. And Father, we pray that. You will be with us as we return a portion of those blessings to the work of your church and that we will do so with a cheerful heart. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Fourth scripture reading in the lesson this morning, we'll sing two verses of Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing. my 
Um, if you will all stand for uh, this morning's scripture reading. Thank you. This morning's scripture reading comes from the, the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Once again, that's 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version, which reads as follows. <clears throat> Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, good morning once again. <clears throat> We're glad that you're here, especially for those who are visiting with us. We're delighted that you are able to be with us this morning. <clears throat> this is not my usual Sunday to preach, uh, but considering the fact that I was out for almost a month and then scheduled to preach the day Kelly got quarantined, from school, and so I owe Grady a little bit of preaching time, so we're making up for a little bit of that uh, this morning in our time together, and I'll be preaching again next Sunday, so if you have other plans and don't want to experience that, well, you you got plenty of time to, to do that before next Sunday. <clears throat> How would you describe the year 2020? I found that picture on the internet, and I think some people would say, yeah, that pretty well sums it all up. It's the worst year ever. I'm going to say up front that Probably not the worst year ever, but it's been bad enough, and it's been difficult enough and frustrating enough, and uh, one website suggested these words to describe 2020, unprecedented, apocalyptic, hellacious, omni-shambles, cruel, extreme, and I think to a certain extent probably all of us feel a little bit that way. It has been a year unlike any other year. One person called 2020 a reality nightmare. And uh, I, I can certainly understand that. Started off with the Australian bushfires, then COVID reared its ugly head, and then perhaps the thing that shook you to your core, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle announced they would no longer take their duties as the royal family as they had been. I know that probably rocked your world, and uh, <clears throat> you're having trouble with that. There was the impeachment trial for our president. The United Kingdom withdrew from the European Union, and March the 16th, the Dow plunged 2,997 points in the worst drop since 1987. We've had rioting in the streets. Three of the largest wildfires in Colorado history occurred this year. Uh, over, when I wrote this anyway, 4.2 million acres had burned in the state of California, and that's bad enough. There were 190 people who died in an explosion in Beirut, Lebanon had the controversy over the Supreme Court nomination, and somewhere in there they talked about murder hornets, although I didn't think that ever came to much, but that's just a, another indication of what this year has been like. On top of that, we had a peaceful, calm presidential election. And one uh, writer, Politico's Alina, uh, Alina Schneider, said this was a democratic civil war, and uh, certainly if paid any attention to the news, you understood that that was one of the most contentious elections we've ever had. It's still not over. We're still waiting to see how all of this is going to play out. Stricter COVID rules went into effect at 5 o'clock on Friday here in El Paso County, and so that makes things a little bit harder in getting out and about and doing those things that we want to do. <clears throat> and as we think about that idea of politics, and we're not going to talk politics this morning, so don't get worried. When you think about the idea of politics and the scripture that, that Arthur just read for us, I exhort, first of all, the supplications, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority. All who are in authority. Who does that include? Well, it includes all who are in authority, according to, to the scripture. Reason, verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And thinking about our modern political landscape, that seems like a tall order, doesn't it? You know, Donald Trump is loved by some and despised by others. 
Joe Biden, Kamala Harris ticket, loved by some, despised by others. But as we think about that in the, the country that literally is, seems like it's almost divided in half, think about when Paul wrote to Timothy. Somewhere 62, 63, depending on what date you, uh, you pick from the historians, who was the chief political officer and figure at the time? Well, that would be Nero, fine, upstanding gentleman that he was. It's said of his reign, it's usually associated with tyranny, extravagance, and debauchery. One site said he was the most infamous man to ever live. And yet at that time, Paul told Timothy, you pray for all who were in authority. And that would have included Nero at that time. And so whether your party won or lost or, or whatever your political viewpoint is, we've been given the challenge. We need to be praying for those who are in authority. That's our obligation. That's God's desire for us. And I think Paul's words are just as vivid in our political landscape as they were 1957 years ago when they were written. But this morning, for the sake of our time together this, today, let's stay in the here and now. Most of 2020 is over with. We can't do anything about it. And the rest of 2020 and 2021, well, I have no clue as to what that's going to look like, and neither do you. It's going to be what it will be, and God will get us through it one way or the other. But let's think about the here and the now. The Holy Spirit-inspired Bible writers use that word now a whole lot of times. In fact, in the King James Version, 1,355 times the word now appears in that particular version. And I thought probably 1,355 was a little too many to look at all of them this morning. Uh, so maybe, what, 500, 400? No, I won't do that to you. We'll look at just six this morning, six instances of where that word is used and draw some lessons from it. First this morning, the now of sacrifice. Hebrews 9 and verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The now of sacrifice. It's just during these last 2,000 years or so, which began with the first coming of Christ and his sacrifice for the sins of the whole world made things different than they had been for the thousands of years prior to that. Christ's sacrifice doesn't have to be repeated as it the sacrifices were in the Old Testament. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sac sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. It is only through Christ's person and finished work at Calvary that we can approach the Father in heaven. And there is no other way, no other name given among men whereby we might be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. And he was the only one who could make that happen. And thankfully, we live on this side of history to understand that, to see that, to be able to look back on the cross and realize what he's done for us, that we can be the full recipients of a sacrifice that once and for all took care of sin. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? And we hope and pray this morning, if you're here this morning and haven't begun your relationship with God, your relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll give serious thought to doing that today so that you can take advantage of the sacrifice that he made on your behalf. Number two this morning, the now of safety. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God's able to keep us. And I think we probably understood that perhaps more this year than any other year, that God has been watching out for us, that things haven't been as bad as they possibly could have been, and we give God the glory for that fact. We don't have to wait for heaven, for safety and security. We can have it right now. We can understand it and appreciate it right now. In John chapter 10, Beginning in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. That's the biggest privilege of being a believer. We're in God's hand and nobody can take us out of it. 
Nobody, not even the devil himself. Yes, we can leave God's hand if we make that choice. But nobody can force us out. Nobody can take us out because we're in the hands, we're in the hands of God. Safety. Sin is ready to destroy us if we give it the chance. You remember Israel as they stood on the shores of the Red Sea. Pharaoh, angry Pharaoh, and his army were bearing down on them. He was coming from one way, the water was on the other side, and they despaired. What are we going to do? We came out into the wilderness to die. And you remember the story. God, through Moses' action, parts the sea. They walk through on dry land. And I still imagine they were a little worried because once they got on dry land and looked back what was happening, here came Pharaoh's army coming through on dry land as well. But you remember the story. God closed the waters in on them and destroyed them, and Pharaoh was no longer a threat. Imagine the relief. The relief when that happened. To know that Pharaoh can't hurt us anymore. His army can't hurt us anymore. You know, sin is like Pharaoh's army. It's after us. And maybe to make a, a similar comparison, when we're immersed in the waters of baptism, sin is destroyed. It can't come through those waters. And it can't come up on the other side. And so now we have safety. The now of serenity, Romans 15 and verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hope and joy. Don't we enjoy those things? We ought to enjoy those things because we're in Christ. Because our sins have been forgiven. Because we have a home in heaven. We ought to appreciate those things every day. We only can do that though if we trust. If we trust in God to be the God of peace that he promised that he is. That peace from God gives us hope. And will eventually lead to eternal life. Because God is on his throne. He is still in charge. And he will always be on his throne. And always be in his charge no matter what's happening here on this earth. And we have to remember that and we have to trust in that. Serenity. Sometimes we're not serene. Though. Sometimes we're not content. Sometimes we want something else. The story is told, and this story was told by Russell Conwell, of an ancient Persian by the name of Ali Hafed. Owned a very large farm. Had orchards that grew lots of uh, grains and, and gardens. He was a wealthy and contented man. Until one day, a traveler from the east told him about diamonds. He said, if you have diamonds, you'll have more money than you ever know what to do with. And somehow that got stuck in his craw. And he started thinking about the diamonds and wanting those diamonds. So he sold his entire property and set out in search of those infamous diamonds, only to end his life in disappointment and suicide because he never found them. Irony of the story. The man who bought his farm one day was bringing his camels out to drink and noticed something sparkly in the water. Pulled it out and lo and behold, guess what it was? It was a diamond. And it would become the Golconda diamond mine, one of the largest uh, known in the history of the world. Had he stayed home, had he stayed content, had he lived his life there, maybe he would have had the, had the diamonds. And even if he didn't, he wouldn't have ended his life in such misery. We need to be serene in the fact that we're in Christ and not go looking for that serenity anywhere else because, well, it can't be found anywhere else. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Peace. That's what we all want. The now of surety. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is being sure of what we, we hope for, the certainty of those things that we can't see. Faith is the believer, as someone said, second pair of eyes that we see and believe in the invisible. Hebrews 11 and verse 27, speaking of Moses. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Faith. Ephesians 1 and verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, which are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Faith understands 
what can't be known naturally by humanity. Faith are those second pair of eyes. And it comes, Romans 10, 17, by the word of God. That's where we find that faith. That's where we come in contact with that faith. That's where that faith begins. That's where that faith grows, coming from the word and from the scriptures that we feel so are so important. But now of sonship. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, in Romans 8, beginning in verse 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. We think about adoption, and our modern concept of adoption is probably a little different than what the uh, Greco-Roman world would have understood at the time that this was written. We think about a little bitty baby doesn't have parents or parents can't take care of it, so we adopt that baby for the security and love that we're going to bring, uh, bring a, about that. But thinking back to, the, to that particular time, and uh, this comes from a book called The Sacrament of Belonging in a Fractured World. It says, adoption was clearly not a foreign concept in the Greco-Roman world, but it's important to know how differently Paul and his communities would have heard that word. Our contemporary concept of adopting an infant with the connotations of nurture and care and compassion is in fact not how they understood adoption in those days. The common understanding of adoption in the Greco-Roman world would have been functional. It was the tool of the elite, especially emperors, to secure succession, to secure legacy, to secure inheritance. Adopted sons were pulled into a bigger story and expected to fulfill an imperial purpose. In those times, adoption was about the coalescing and movement of power, not the rescue of orphans. Think about that in light of Christianity. Isn't that what happens to us when we become adopted in Christ? We become part of something bigger than ourselves. And it's about inheritance, and it's about legacy, and it's about succession, and all of those things that that particular article talked about. The idea that as adopted sons of God, we are part of a family that otherwise we would never have anything to do with. But because of Jesus Christ, we can be a part of that great family that's going to eventually lead us to heaven and have the creator of the universe as our father. We are told that we are now the sons of God. Thank God we've been born spiritually and that we are his children. And as we think about that sonship, that ought to bring us that comfort, that assurance to know that I'm going to always be God's son. Even the prodigal, as we call him, was still the son, even though he left home and went out and wasted his, his inheritance and riotous living, he was still the son. And we need to understand that we'll always be the son of God. Number six, the now of salvation. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And as we bring our thoughts to a close this morning, this is where we wanted to get to. Now is the day of salvation. And so the question is, have you been saved? Have you been immersed in the waters of baptism so that your sin can be washed away so you can rise up to walk in newness of life so you can rise up clothed with Christ? If not, we hope and pray that now is the time you'll consider doing just that. The Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas have been in prison for preaching the gospel. In the innermost part of the jail, their feet were locked in the stocks. And you know what they were doing? They were singing and they were praying and all the prisoners and all the guards were listening to them. And then there was the earthquake, and the chains fell off, and the doors fell open, and the jailer, thinking that his prisoners had gotten away, was about to take his life, when Paul said, no, we're all here. And it's at that point that he fell down at their feet, and he asked that most important question. Let's just read that account together. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison... Awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. 
And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What a question. What must I do to be saved? Then they spoke the words of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them, notice this, the same hour of the night. He washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. That day of salvation was that very night for that jailer. And he accepted it. He embraced it. And then he was able to say, or verse 34 is able to say, now he rejoiced because he had believed with God or believed in God with all of his household. What a beautiful thought to know that now can be the time you're saved from your sins. Psalm chapter 69 and verse 13. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. And that's his call for you this morning, to be saved, to be a part of the family of God and enjoy all those things that we've talked about this morning. Sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice for safety, for serenity, for surety, for sonship, for salvation. All of those can be yours today, but it's up to you to make that choice. And the simplest way for you to do that is merely step out in the aisle and walk forward. One of our elders will be down here. Discuss with you whatever you need, and we'll do whatever we can to help you in that process. But this morning, don't leave this place without the assurance of salvation and the promise of all of those things we've talked about this morning. Because life is too short. And as we said, we don't know what the rest of 2020 holds, nor what 2021 holds. It may not be good. So make sure you're ready to face that, and you can start that today, as together we stand and sing. string pilgrims and then we'll be wrapping it up. Here we are but straying pilgrims here our path is often dim but 
to cheer us on our journey still we sing this wayside hymn yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise soon will be our home forever and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way here the tempest darkly gathers but our hearts within us say yonder rise soon will be our home forever and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrims lurking foe but the lord is our defender and he tells us we may know yonder rise soon will be our home forever and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes let's pray most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship you have given us and this time of worship and being with each other. Father, be with us all as through this pandemic. Keep us all safe from this COVID. Father, be with all of our shut-ins. Bless them and keep them safe. Be with all our soldiers. Father, we thank you for your son and the gift that he has brought in us all. Father, forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. There's a couple of things going on at our church building this week that we want to tell you about or remind you. First up, this coming Wednesday morning at 11 a.m., a group of volunteers will come together and help put out, stamp, address, get a paper ready for mailing. The paper is the Unveiled Gospel. And we salute our brethren, Tom Wright, out at Falcon, the Calhan Congregation, Terry Smalling down at La Junta, and Mark Johnson, the Columbine Congregation up in the Denver area. They're writing good articles, editing the material, getting everything ready for production, and then the paper is printed and assembled and folded and collated and put into envelopes and stamped and ready to take to the post office. All of that happens at our church building, and we have folks come in to help with that. And if you're able to help us out, I hope that you'll give the church office a call tomorrow, Tuesday, first thing Wednesday morning. We don't want to have too many people in the same room downstairs, the table spread out, the papers ready for assembly, but we're still maintaining social distancing and wearing face masks, don't you know? And so if you're able and willing to help in this good work, uh, let us know, and we will be doing that Wednesday morning, and then Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, our ladies, women of the word, they'll be coming together at our church building and putting together gift baskets, cards, seasonal things, and these will go to our sick, shut-in, and others. And this, too, is a good work, a bit of holiday cheer for maybe those who need it most. And ladies, remember, 
Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. And if you're not able to come and help in the assembling of those gift baskets, but you want to donate the fruit and nuts and the goodies that go into them, well, just let us know and we'll send you that list again of what you can drop off at the building before Thursday morning. And that will be a very welcome thing. And then Sister Ricky Martin has shared with us the terrible news that her family home in Oregon has burned and everything has been lost. And that's a blow to her family. And I think even those of us that haven't gone through a tragedy like that, we can begin to imagine what a trauma that is. And there will be ways that we can help. And we'll be passing along that news and information to you just as soon as we know. But let's remember Ricky and her family in our prayer. And then I've just received this text from Sister Mona Bowers, and she says her aunt, Yvonne Zobel, has tested positive for the COVID-19 as in in quarantine, and she definitely has underlying health conditions. She decided to visit family at Thanksgiving, and they're thinking that's where the exposure occurred and that's kind of a double whammy on those folks and we want to remember Mona's aunt and all of her family as they go through this particular ordeal. Now then tonight at six o'clock, Ed and Sharon Mann's Zoom Fellowship and that's a good thing if you haven't taken advantage you log in and we just talk about nothing so terribly important, but you know, you don't have to wear a face mask when you're on the virtual fellowship software and we can see one another, chat just a little bit, kind of like we once did after and before services at our building. We're not able to do that now. And maybe this is the next best thing. It's kind of an informal sharing of what's going on, how we're doing, and keeping up with one another. And we'd like to see your smiling, friendly face. And that's this evening at 6 o'clock. Now then, until the next time when we're able to come together, may the Lord bless and keep us all.